Now we are moving on to the topic of risk analysis, and that includes both biological and chemical risks. And every day we make judgments based on our perception of how risky something is. And that um, assessment may or may not be supported by data. So let's walk through the process first. So the first step is to take a look at the risk and determine what the hazard is that you're looking at, what is its toxicity, and what is the amount of exposure you would have to that. Maybe you would have exposure through to a chemical through work. Maybe you would have exposure to a bacteria because you are an employee of a hospital. So this is your risk assessment phase. And it's partly based on factual information and partly based on your personal perceptions. The next step in the process is risk acceptance. And that's when the individual determines what level of risk um, is acceptable to them. And this is often balanced against social, economic, and political considerations. So if we look, for example, at COVID-19, it certainly has social implications, particularly for young people who might be more isolated as a result of COVID-19. It certainly has economic impact if you consider the people who are out of work or who do work but have a job where they are exposed to the agent perhaps more than they would like to be or feel comfortable with. And then certainly there are political considerations. It certainly became a political issue regarding wearing masks and what the risks were and how big a group could you have. Um, so if a particular politician um, was faced with a situation where they are told on the one hand, this is, and they think maybe this is what um, should happen, but their constituents who they represent disagree with that, then they're not going to, for example, put in a mask mandate. So that's acceptance of a certain level of risk. And last is managing the risk. Determine what policy needs to be in place. And this policy has to be developed with input from private citizens, from industries, and from special interest groups. And all of that gets rolled into one ball. Now let's take a look at that very first step, which was risk assessment, and look at the difference between perceived risk and actual risk. The perception that certain behaviors or activities entail a high risk does not always reflect reality or the actual risk. What do you as a student perceive to be the highest risk of death in the United States? That might be based on your personal health experience or the health experience of others in your household, for example, or it may be um, on target with the actual risk. So let's look at a couple of questions. Is a person more likely to die from a bee sting lightning, falling, or an earthquake. See if you can rate those as to which you think is most likely to least likely to have caused a death. And is the risk of death higher when you drive or when you fly? You've probably heard about that before. Oops. Okay, so if we look at the risk of um, fatality, Heart disease is number one, followed by cancer and stroke and then motor vehicle accident. And some of this heart disease and cancer and stroke may have been things that you've experienced in your family, friends, household, etc. So that might not surprise you. Um, if we look down here, the risk of dying from falling is actually quite high. And that is, includes both an elderly population and a um, work site such as construction. And then if we move down to the ones I asked you about, um, let's see, driving a, a, photo, a fatal motor vehicle accident is far more likely than dying in an airplane accident. And that's because you're ex repeatedly exposed 
to this risk of a motor vehicle accident, and you may only fly once in a while, so you're not exposed to that risk all that often. Bee sting is down here, followed by lightning, and then earthquake um, is even less. So why is this information important? Well, this information is important because we want to know what we can do um, to either prevent some of these things from happening, or if we can't prevent them, what can we do to improve treatment outcomes? And that's why it's important to have a very clear concept of what those risks are. And again, you can see that these are a risk of um, a variety of things from physical dying from heat stroke, for example, to what could be considered biological. So there are two philosophies of risk assessment in management, the innocent until proven guilty principle and the precautionary principle. So innocent until proven guilty, that's sort of like we use in our, our courtrooms. And that philosophy states that a product or service poses an unacceptable risk only if proven so in practice or by research. And a precautionary principle says if a hazard is plausible but not quite proven, steps must be taken to reduce or remove the hazard. So let me give you an example of two countries that took different um, philosophies of risk management. And that's the United States versus the U European Union with regard to asbestos. Um, it became known in the early 1960s, um, well, about 1965, evidence surfaced that said asbestos caused cancer. Exposure to asbestos caused cancer. The United States took the precautionary principle, where though it wasn't 100% proven at that point, it was plausible that there was a, and there was a definite notice that there was a connection between being exposed to asbestos and having lung cancer. And they took the precautionary principle and banned it. The European Union took the philosophy that innocent until proven guilty, that asbestos may have been associated with lung cancer, but it wasn't definitely proven to have been the cause of the lung cancer. And so they didn't ban it in 1965, they banned it in 1999. Um, actually, the U.S. banned it in the 70s. But if the European Union had banned it in the 70s, as the United States have, they could have saved 34,000 people from exposure and death and $25 billion in cleanup because they continued to use this prod product. So um, we look at these approaches to risk management, and it doesn't have to be just something um, as universal as, let's say, asbestos. It could be to any product, such as a chemical used on clothing um, that's produced in China um, and it's sprayed with a pesticide to keep it from being eaten by insects as it's stored and moved to other countries. And so um, it may not be demonstrated, it may not be proven that that chemical is going to cause a health issue. But the precautionary, the person who takes the precautionary principle to that particular hazard might wash their clothes once they purchase them and before wearing them. Um, a person who believes the or follows the innocent until proven guilty principle would just go ahead and wear that clothing um, without washing it first. So these philosophies become important when you consider that most chemicals have never even been tested. So we don't have um, data on which to assess a particular risk of a chemical. So there have been, there are different estimates of how many synthetic chemicals have been introduced since the 1950s. And the upper end of that might be about 12,000 synthetic chemicals, certainly between 8 and 12,000. Now the chemical industry says there are far fewer because where this number comes from is that a synthetic chemical, if it's altered even slightly, becomes a new chemical. 
And so that new chemical that altered from a, an original chemical contributes to this 10,000 number, whereas the chemical industry does not believe it should add to that number. However, if you look at something chemically, when you change something chemically, you change what the chemical is. And it's very possible that that new chemical will have, <clears throat> excuse me, an impact on human health that the original chemical did not. So let's take the example of um, the methane and ethane and butane. All of those are gases when you get up to five carbons. After that, it becomes a, um, it's no longer able to be a gas. So it's obvious that by the addition of one more carbon and a couple of hydrogens, um, two hydrogens to be specific, you do alter the chemical significantly such that it's not even a, a gas anymore. So um, many people would say that it is reasonable to classify each of these chemicals individually. So even if you used a lower number, only 2% of chemicals that are on the market have been tested to see if they are carcinogenic. That's because many of them were developed in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s before people were truly aware of this, and many products were grandfathered or given permission to not be tested since they were already on the market. Um, the other issue is that there may be synergistic harmful effects where two chemicals such as tobacco smoke and the asbestos that we looked at earlier um, create a more harmful effect than either one alone. Next, it can take years, such as with um, cigarette smoke and um, lung cancer. It may take years for um, a harmful effect to show up. And the other thing is, it's hard to isolate, when you're doing these studies, it's hard to isolate a particular chemical and test it. So we are exposed to so many chemicals, it's really hard to know if we became ill from, I don't know, a food preservative or uh, something that we were using to control weeds in our yard. It's just really impossible because there are so many chemicals out there. All right, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the next wrap-up slides, but just so you know, there is something called the Dirty Dozen, where international groups met um, from 127 nations to agree to restrict the use of certain chemicals, mainly endocrine disruptors. And they came up with a Dirty Dozen, the 12 most dangerous, uh, most risky chemicals, including DDT. And they decided to ban them. They met again in 2009 and updated the regulations to add some additional chemicals. And this kind of thing can continue um, to occur. So you can review your key concepts. Um, we have significant hazards from infectious disease and from exposures to chemicals. And it's difficult to evaluate the risk. Um, many chemicals haven't been tested. They may act, interact synergistically or they may take years to show up. Uh, biological agents, as we are currently seeing, um, we've made some strides in things like, uh, let's say, heart disease, but there are um, other emergent diseases that we are still um, having difficulty uh, responding to. So the best we can do is to remain as informed as possible and make good lifestyle choices where possible to reduce our risk.